Thank you for joining us. My name is Carrie Smith, and on behalf of Cumulus Networks, I'd like to welcome you to Network Operations for the Modern Cloud Era. Presenting today will be uh, our puppet guru, Chris Amundsen, Senior Operations Engineer at Puppet Labs, and Jose Palafox, a puppet veteran. We also have Mina Shankaran of Cumulus Networks, who heads up all of the ecosystem software solutions. She has extensive depth and expertise in the data center space combined with a business and technical acumen. As Cumulus Networks brings additional joint solutions with the ecosystems to market, today we'd like to dive into some of the benefits of a combined software solution with Puppet Labs and Cumulus Linux. The webinar will be about 30 to 45 minutes. We'll answer a few questions from the participant at the end, if time permits. For those of you interested, you have the opportunity to ask questions during the webinar by using the window marked questions. Simply type in your questions and click send. You can also tweet your questions to us, and our Twitter handle is at Cumulus Networks. Um, really quick, we're going to ask a, an audience question. Um, do you use Puppet in your environment today? You have four options. And we'll give you about 20 seconds, and then we'll go ahead and turn this over to Chris. Great. And Chris, thanks, thanks a lot. We're excited to have you join us. Oh, it's great to be here. Um, so we're going to, let's see, and take a look at this poll real quick here. It looks like uh, we got some people evaluating, and uh, we, got, we do have some Puppet users, users out there, so that's, that's a good response there. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about what, you know, who we are, what Puppet Labs is. Uh, we were founded in 2005 by Luke Knees. Um, we've got a lot of nodes that we manage, about you know, over 10 million. Um, we're also funded. Uh, we have some VC funding from VMware, Kleiner, and uh, Google Ventures. We have a pretty huge ecosystem as far as devices that we're currently managing in data centers. Um, if, we're, if you're hitting uh, all the major players in the data center space today, you're probably coming across a device that has uh, Puppet running on it. And uh, we do have a lot of customers as well. And you know, one thing that's great about Puppet Labs is our community. That's where we're getting a lot of our great modules built and uh, just a kind of a, a mind share of, of implementations and, and technology. So, uh, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring automation to the IT space in, in various ways. And what we see with uh, manual management is just a lot, of, a lot of custom scripts being made that maybe aren't consistent um, across an organization, uh, not being change controlled. Also, the speed of execution, um, you know, how quickly the business is asking IT for services to be brought online and when we as network engineers can deliver those services. So our, not only the business, we're, we're getting requirements from the business, we're getting requirements from our systems teams as well, whether it be a new web service or or something that's requiring an underlying network infrastructure that, uh, that we build. Um, and we have some numbers here about percentages of, of what managers are looking at that. So there we go for some stats. So what is our approach as Puppet Labs and Puppet Enterprise? Uh, we're a client server architecture. We're secured over TLS. Um, so we have a Puppet Master server and we have agents. Um, and you know those those agents are coming to more and more network devices, especially Cumulus networks uh, switches. So what we're doing is we're writing code that's abstracting how we're configuring uh, the underlying how this device is configured, uh, abstracted to you know writing puppet code. So you can define something uh, that you want to configure, whether it's a CentOS machine or a Cumulus switch. Uh, the the Puppet uh, underlying architecture knows how to configure uh, that, that service. Um, so we're kind of doing that resource abstraction. You can bring this into your legacy environment. So this is something you can, uh, you can currently bring to uh, your systems. And you know, today we're going to talk about how we can uh, see that being brought to network devices. Uh, one example of this is where uh, we're seeing uh, gaps being bridged between the systems and network environment. Here at Puppet Labs Operations, uh, we're doing a little bit of AnyCast just for internal DNS. And so we have systems that are running 
a Quagga, which is routing software, you know, running OSPF, injecting our Anycast routes into the uh, environment. But then we're also running, uh, you see Quagga running on the Cumulus switches as well, which is, you know, can provide the core routing uh, infrastructure. So you're seeing a lot of integration between these two sides. And this is where Puppet Enterprise comes in, is when we're configuring Quagga in one place that's defining our parameters, we're able to push those out to you know, different types of devices. One is a network switch, one is a server that's uh, you know, it's running bind. <clears throat> so here we have kind of an example of what, um, how you're writing this puppet code. You're, you're defining the state of what you want the service to look like. And you're doing this one time, whether it be, you know, again, CentOS or Cumulus. Um, so in this case, SSH is the particular service that we're wanting to manage. Uh, we want to ensure that it's running, and whenever we reboot these devices, we want their state to be online and running. So we say that's enable true. Um, this is just a very small example, but through, uh, through Puppet Labs and our community, we're building thousands of, of modules to manage all aspects of, of systems and more networking devices. So, um, you know, whether this is SSH that's running on Solaris or Cumulus, we're able to write the same type of code in one place, have it change managed, and, and the agents are out there ensuring that these are, uh, this is how we want the state. The, uh, the other power of the modules is because a lot of our code is open source, you can also write your own modules. So if you do want to get more in-depth beyond configuration and say, like, right now we don't have an XORP, an XOR module, which is an open source routing uh, platform, well, you can write modules to start managing the configuration of an XORP environment. So, um, but we also do have modules for BIRD and Quagga. Um, so these modules are on what we call Puppet Forge, or the Forge. Uh, some examples of those modules are the Cumulus NetDev module. Uh, we have things like NTP, SNMP, IP tables, NetFilter. And then also uh, we just announced Puppet Approved modules, uh, which are modules that we're vetting for the network environment, and especially Cumulus, where you know, we're, we're taking the stuff you see in the community, we're testing it against actual cumulus devices, and you know we're giving them our stamp of approval. The uh, one of the benefits of writing this puppet code to manage your network infrastructure is that as you're writing it, you can simulate this as well. So, you know, you're writing configurations to manage SSH, manage NTP throw an SNMP uh, daemon on here to start sending to, uh, uh, you know, to your upstream. And you can run Puppet without making changes to see what would be changed. And this could be done in a test environment. Um, you know, it could be done on a production device without making changes. And if changes are made, so when you're ready to move from the simulate to the, the enforce stage, uh, if no changes have been made, to parts of the configuration that you're not changing, things won't be re restarted. So if you're modifying OS OSPF configurations but not BGP, it's going to see that nothing has changed with BGP, and it's not going to bounce those protocols. So you're not going to see a, a, your neighbors bounce on those. Um, so with enforcement, you know, Puppet runs every 30 minutes. Uh, through the Puppet console, we also have a live management that you can push any time. And so this is saying that if someone logs into a machine and they're not following the right procedure, if you're using Puppet in your workflow, it's going to enforce what's currently defined in the Puppet config. So, so when you're looking at your Puppet code, that should be the state that your infrastructure is currently in. And the last piece that we're talking about in this section is, is the reporting. So we've done, we've written the code, we've run it through our simulations and testing. Uh, our Puppet agents on our network devices are checking into the Puppet Master uh, and they're configuring themselves. We're able to now pull reporting on what is compliant, what isn't. Have we had a node that's gone away? Um, do we have 
uh, devices that are in certain states that we're, we're testing, all these things that, that we've done can be rolled up into reporting that's through our public council. Um, so this kind of gets into what we call facts, which is kind of metadata for devices. So currently, if you look at a server, uh, the default facts that you, we generate uh, on the Puppet agent are things like CPU cores and uh, Ethernet interface MAC addresses and IP addresses, basically just all this information. And you can write custom facts. So if you want if you want to create something that is specific to your environment that you want to know about a box, you can create a fact and you can set the states of those facts. So an example of that is if you know if you got say an MPLS environment with provider provider edge uh, customer edge devices, well you could push custom facts that say whether this is a P or a PE device, and you can make coding decisions based on whether that device is that role. Um, Another example would be if you wanted to define a switch type for whether you're a leaf or spine, you could, you could then apply different configurations to Quagga uh, to its BGP AS number, or um, you know, if you're deploying new infrastructure, uh, you could set these facts and then have, have them be brought online in a specific state using public code. Uh, and so we, we kind of, we're pulling all this together and well, so what are the, some of the benefits? Basically, you're able to configure more equipment. Uh, the speed at which you can build common configurations and then have one or a thousand devices configure themselves all at once um, or within a puppet agent run is, is beneficial. I mean, we all want to get more done in less time. So, you know, if you're bringing up a data center and you've pre-tested uh, your puppet configs and you've got maybe a hundred switches being installed by remote hands uh, it just allows you to, uh, to do that faster and remotely. Um, the, uh, with the reporting capabilities, then you also get uh, the, the capability to see what, okay, now we've, we've done this installation, what is the actual state? Did we get 10% of our nodes that didn't come up online? What is their current state? Is, do we have a remote system in who's not, didn't get the memo on how we're doing things now and is changing configurations individually? Uh, that, that's kind of what the insider reporting uh, capabilities give us. So we are, again, we're in a lot of places. We're in the enterprise. We're in the service provider. Uh, these are kind of all our markets. And uh, speci specifically, I want to talk about uh, the finance, financial market. Um, in finance, we come up against a lot of uh, security and compliance requirements and reporting. Uh, we see this in, in insurance as well. It's how is your IT infrastructure currently configured? Is it configured the way that you think it's configured? Um, one example is kind of the, uh, the shell shock bug that everyone's been talking about the last week. Uh, here at Public Labs Operations, we had about a 24-hour turnaround from when that bug hit the scene so when we were able to patch uh, all our machines, all our switches, and also apply firewall rules that are, uh, uh, that are say, we're going to take services offline or block um, connectivity to management services that are vulnerable but don't have patches available yet. One example of this is here at uh, Public Labs, we use Xeris Wireless Gear. They didn't have uh, patch ready for their XMS management platform. So we are able to use puppet code to push uh, firewall rules that just limited who can access that web interface, uh, are we going to do it through a VPN, et cetera. Um, so some other benefits of why, why we want to bring puppet into the network, and especially with Cumulus, is the uh, Zero touch provisioning with ONI, um, this is kind of bringing pixie booting to the network world. So this is where you can bring management interfaces online uh, that DHCP with a DHCP option, they download their cumulus image and install them, which pulls down as part of that process, pulls in a puppet agent that then can configure itself based on uh, you know, engineering or architectures, initial configurations, um, 
that are then pushed once the box comes online. So this kind of comes back to that uh, building data centers quickly is, is uh, I can test in a lab how the infrastructure is going to look. If that's going to get duplicated 100 times, you know, I define my nodes. The hardware gets installed. It, it, pick, it, uh, it only boots. And then, uh, you know, all of my images are pushed out and Puppet configuration applied. Um, the other, there's a, we're also seeing more, a bigger hardware ecosystem. So instead of I have to stick with this vendor, uh, this hardware vendor, in order to maintain my environment with this OS, what we're seeing is we have, uh, with Cumus Networks, a kind of an open operating system for managing network equipment, and we have multiple hardware vendors that we can pick and choose from that support that operating system. So, you know, that will, that will kind of push competition and lower prices. You know, there's all sorts of benefits for having uh, more competition and having a common environment to work in. Um, underneath the hood, Cumulus Linux is Linux based, it's based on Debian. So in addition to uh, the custom tools that Cumulus is building for managing uh, switch ASICs, you're getting all of the tool sets that you get on a Linux box in Debian anyway. So if you need to in install a TCP dump or you want an SFlow exporter or uh, you want a test environment where you need to install a tool that generates traffic for uh, intrusion prevention systems that you want to test, uh, these tools are all inside Debian and they're just standard packages that you can install. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Cumulus. Hey, thanks guys. Um, so I'm going to run a quick poll question here before we start off. And um, looks like the poll has just started. It's how much do you think is the cost per port of a Cumulus Linux powered 10 gig switch with uh, Puppet Enterprise? Take a guess, and it um, looks like we're getting some interesting responses. Definitely curious. All right, I'll jump in. Um, well, the answer, for those who have not entered it yet, but the answer is about $100. And um, we at Cumulus Networks have a shared vision uh, with Puppet Labs of truly kind of maintaining that pricing transparency. So you can check out the licensing online for 1 gig, 10 gig, or 4 gigs. And you'll notice that the cost per license, if you actually pulled out, say, a 128-port 10 gig switch, will be about $1,000. So it sounds like a really good deal to me. Um, thanks, Chris. Uh, that was a great overview of Puppet. All of us can use some of the automation help uh, we can get as CCIEs. And it looks like 45% of the crowd got it correct. So at least you're on the right track. So what's the solution to bridge the NetOps folks with the DevOps folks, right? Um, and we believe it's Cumulus Linux. And as uh, Chris sort of mentioned, it's Linux. We use the Debian VZ distribution for building a native Linux operating system. They are uh, a very strong proponent of the open source uh, community and are consistently contributing our enhancements to uh, the Linux community as well as the Quagga uh, community. Quagga is what we use for our routing protocol suite. And being Linux, a Cumulus Linux powered bare metal switch drives like any other Debian system you've ever used. So there's no special command line interface or shell dedicated to switching routing and any other network uh, operations. You can pretty much manage your network switches as if it was a server and use all the existing Linux tool sets to configure uh, not just the network, but then now you get to provision all of your server storage and network centrally. So one of the core designs that you see in this slide for uh, Cumulus Linux is, is to have an open framework so that essentially Cumulus Linux can become a platform for all technologies to function as several applications residing on Cumulus Linux. And this can be like virtualization overlays or security apps or you know, network monitoring elements like SFlow and Inmon. Um, and several others. So 
we provide customers, you know, not just the choice of applications and a choice of OS, but it's fundamentally even giving them the choice of hardware so you can have a full portfolio of 1 gig, 10 gig, and 40 gig switches running Cumulus Linux and then now use a tool like Puppet and then just automate all of that uh, infrastructure. So we're not going to uh, cover ONI in too much depth. Uh, we do have a recording of a previously done ONI dedicated webinar. But what I do want to touch upon is uh, ONI also stands for Open Network Install Environment. It's an enhanced Pixie bootloader mechanism like Chris also kind of mentioned previously. Um, it allows the capable DSO for multiple OSs to be installed on the hardware switches. And Cumulus Networks contributed this to the Open Compute project, so now it allows a variety of ODM vendors such as Quanta, Acton, Celestica, and others to adopt and increase the maturity of this hardware ecosystem. And it kind of promotes the open networking design for the modern data center fabric that everyone's really striving for. And it also kind of aligns with you know, some of the vision from, that you're hearing on the software-defined data center side. So we can work with overlays, we can work with controllers, we can work with, say, you know, some of the OpenStack integration components. And then with that hardware abstraction, now you have tools like Puppet that can completely orchestrate the entire stack. So that's sort of how we realize the benefits of ONI. Now to jump in a little bit about uh, kind of how that zero touch provisioning and how this all kind of comes to fruition, three waterfalls occur within ONI. Its entire focus is on three loops, discovery, file transfer, and then execution. The first of these loops is to kind of get on the network, begins on the management Ethernet port, starts with any of your modern product protocols, and ending with some, you know, a well-known IPv4 address. The second step, you know, you use HTTP, fetch the operating system installation image, uh, once the image is fetched, it's saved, and then executed on the switch, right? So there are several uh, Cumulus Linux innovations. Uh, what I'm going to touch upon are two prominent ones that really sort of uh, are leveraged heavily by our customers from a kind of network layout, network interface dependencies, as well as um, another one that I'm going to touch is Prescriptive Topology Manager. So one of the prominent ones or uh, a very important feature that we talk about is IF up down 2 capability. Uh, the IF up down 2, just the IF up down feature has no knowledge of you know, interface configuration dependency, uh, which becomes a burden on the user. And for large scale uh, configuration results, it turns out in the large files, too many files with no support for um, say incremental changes or if you're querying or validating um, running interface configuration. So we landed up doing an entire new implementation of if up down in Python, and we call it I've up down 2. It's backward compatible with the IF up down interfaces format, commands, uh, and it's truly a pluggable architecture with add-on Python modules for any of your interface configuration. Uh, because we're Debian based, we can do everything via Puppet, so configure users, interface configuration, and the routing software you know, with Quagga. Another feature that I talked earlier um, mentioned was prescriptive topology manager. Most folks discover while troubleshooting that many reachable T or unpredictable low performance issues are due to improper cabling. So we have a well understood graph modeling language such as GraphWiz and we manage the complete blueprint of this network connectivity uh, via a doc file that is pushed out to, say, each of the nodes. So each switch determines uh, you know, all of its relevant interconnects, where the discovery protocol is used, and um, all the verification is done through LLDP. So as you see, there are several mechanisms of provisioning the network with sort of no manual intervention using Cumulus Linux and automating it centrally with uh, Puppet. So if all of this sounds interesting, uh, you should certainly check out the Cumulus Workbench. Um, what I have here is a sort of like a sample two-leave, two-spine switches. And you'll see a jump server that hosts the Puppet Master, and you have agents running on the four switches. But before that, what are, why is it so important that we actually leverage Puppet with Cumulus? The traditional way, if you look at it, 
from ordering to production, it would take days and hours and days, and you know, there's a lot of manual effort. The new way that we believe uh, with the zero test provisioning script and talking about ONI and how cumulus actually works, um, it's pretty amazing to see a matter of a few minutes for an entire setup to be brought up live. So as mentioned, that's kind of like a quick uh, workbench setup uh, with the two leaf, two spine switches. And um, what you should certainly do is uh, the workbench is no risk, no investment, zero dollars for you to kind of come on board and check out Cumulus Linux. And you also get to have some of the Puppet manifest, play with the fact, and uh, see how the Puppet automation looks on the Cumulus Linux switches. So it gives you sort of this opportunity to try out um, in your own time and we can book you for a couple of days or a week based on you know, how many team members want to play with it and certainly leverage uh, and learn more about Puppet and Cumulus and us together. Uh, in the interest of time, what, I, what we have done is we've created sort of like a quick video that, um, and we've sped up the video because by the time you install the Puppet agent and all the four switches and then you have the master sitting on the jump server, it can take a couple of minutes uh, for all the servers to boot. So let me um, play that real quick. I'm just going to quickly share the screen here. Okay, hopefully that works for everybody. And play the video here. Um, in the start, nothing fancy. Just see um, all of the scripts coming up. Um, the agent starts running. You'll see a quick warning come up. And, yeah, so this, um, is a, this is an example of a puppet agent run. Yep. We're doing. Yeah, jump in, Chris. Um, I mean, we've kind of compressed like a 12-minute uh, process into sort of like this three minutes, so at least you kind of get a quick idea. Um, but yeah, once so you actually, actually go uh, into the workbench, this, this is a cumulus switch speaking with a puppet master, and we're just doing some basic things. We're changing. Uh, we have a set configuration for what the uh, message of the day should look like, um, and you can see that uh, we are, we're doing MD5 checksums on what, what uh, the puppet master server thinks uh, that the switch should be configured at. When they don't match, it's going to push down the new uh, what it should be. Um, and you can see that we accepted the license, which causes a restart of the switch D process. So you can define that if this configuration file change, do the following actions. And one of those actions can be restart the service in order to reload the configuration. Uh, we also apply a standard NTP config. Um, and, and then in the end here, we're running Cumulus Linux specific commands and some Linux uh, generic commands to show uh, routing state information. Because uh, earlier in this demo, uh, there was uh, basically enabling Quagga. So we, we defined a service of Quagga. This is, you know, this is going to run at start, and here's the configuration file, uh, the contents of the configuration file that it should be in. And then it restarts the Quagga service. Yep. And to add, to add to that, the switch D is the purely the only proprietary component that you see on Cumulus Linux. The rest of the components, all the enhancements that are done on Quagga are pushed back upstream. So as you saw, switch D restart. Um, and when the license file is installed, that's when you get access to all the front panel ports on the switch. And um, you saw that we just randomly kind of configured two users, like one rocket, one turtle. And uh, some of the commands, you would do IP route show, get all of your IP routes. You would do CLOSPF neighbors, understand the different neighbors. And as I'd mentioned, prescriptive topology manager before, so you see PTMD uh, with the topology dot file pop up. It shows the connectivity cabling um, of the different ports. So you see switch port one or switch port two, how are they connected? Kind of gives you a good and accurate reflection of the uh, cabling so you know that when your OSPF neighbor data is actually discovered, it's much more accurate. So this whole, uh, you can, Take, you can have a chance to play with all of these and uh, also get a chance to leverage them. Okay, let me go back to, I think so. This is going back to the presentation. 
Hold on a second here. There, oh, there it is. Thank you. Um, and so finally one thing I, I do want to talk about is the, the resources. So some of the uh, resources, I don't know if you're seeing the screen here, um, we have several tool sets that are available. Um, so one of the components we've talked about is the Cumulus Workbench. So if you go, it's our Solution Center. All of the sample configurations that we showed you on the demo code are available on GitHub. So you can actually use the GitHub code, play with it in your own setup uh, without our help, or you can also come on the workbench and leverage it through us. Um, and you have some demo videos to go through a full detailed explanation. There are blog posts. There are several knowledge base articles to discuss uh, OSPF unnumbered and other uh, unique Cumulus feature sets. And uh, we've also done a lot of joint collateral with Puppet. So certainly ask you, uh, if you have a few minutes, take a look at them. I think you'll find it valuable uh, as you kind of embark in this transition. So with that, um, thanks for your time. I think I'll turn it over to Carrie because we've got a lot of interesting questions coming in. Would love to get some uh, few minutes of Q&A. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, a few great questions coming in through the chat. Uh, first question, and I think, Chris, this might be for you. If I'm a Cisco CCIE, what is the benefit for me to learn Puppet versus using CLI and other Cisco management tools? Uh, well, there's, I can think of a couple things real quick. The one thing we're seeing is, is Puppet Enterprise bringing kind of teams together. So systems and networking teams unifying their tool sets. You know, if I'm a network engineer, I'm talking to my systems guy and we want to implement a service, whether that be a new website that's going to take database servers, web servers all the way down to switching infrastructure and, and peering with certain folks, um, or even some cloud uh, infrastructure. They're, we're talking the same language and we're working together on configurations. And, and so that's, that's kind of a benefit. The, I also see this as it's a great way to prototype infrastructure. So you know, you're basically when you're writing your puppet code that you want to run in a test environment, that can then directly be turned into production code. So you're just getting higher quality implementation uh, you know, if you're big enough to have a separate architecture uh, engineering department from your operations, you, you're seeing higher quality being turned over from the people who are, who are designing it, choosing the technologies, to the people who are uh, rack and stack, installing, doing the initial configs to, uh, to build it to design. And also, you're going to be seeing Puppet Enterprise coming to more network devices in the data center. So, uh, you know, we're on F5 load balancers. We're on Nginx and Apache and HAProxy and Cumulus switches. And so, you're seeing kind of a common language that's unifying all these, these uh, devices in the data center. Um, and so, yeah, you're just going to be seeing this more often. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, next question. Hey, I missed Cup Puppet Conf last week. What do you think would be the highlight if I'm a Puppet open source user with Cumulus Linux? And Jose, this might be the best question for you. Yeah, so uh, next week, I believe, on the 9th, we'll be releasing all of the Puppet Comp videos. And what I would look for there is uh, the talk by Leslie from Cumulus Networks, uh, which was a, a more in-depth overview of the integration we have with Cumulus. Um, and also look for John Willis' talk, uh, which covers DevOps in sort of an SDN and network context. Uh, so those are both really well-received sessions that are worth taking a look at. You can register to get notified for when the videos go out. Uh, if you go to puppetconf.com, it will be right in the header to register to get notified or check back on the website after the 9th, and all the videos and content and slide decks will be posted. Great, thanks. And Mina, this might be a question for you. Do you have uh, customers using Cumulus Linux with Puppet in production? Yeah, uh, actually that's a great question. Um, we do have customers using Cumulus uh, with uh, Puppet in production. Um, of course, this might sound uh, funny, but there are a few of them that we cannot mention uh, publicly, uh, but they are large cloud scale uh, and Web2.0 sort of the space vertical companies. 
and they are have it, uh, they are using it for a large number of nodes and standardized on Puppet um, across the board for not just their network and uh, leveraging it centrally. Um, so it, I mean, it, it's interesting um, in terms of how they're deploying it in production and how they're actually evaluating it, but. Um, we are seeing traction across uh, higher ed, uh, financials, uh, but heavily in the web scale space as well. Great, thanks. And can I procure Cumulus Linux and Puppet from a partner, or do I need to go to two different places? Um, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so Cumulus Linux, of course, you can, you know, it, it's completely the customer's choice. You can come on our website and just uh, procure the Cumulus Linux software from us. And, you know, kind of if you're doing Puppet open source, go to Puppet, uh, just download it online. Or if you're getting Puppet Enterprise, um, we also have channel partners that are kind of like an interlock between shared between Puppet and Cumulus that will sell you kind of the joint solution of Cumulus and Puppet together. So it's purely uh, the procurement model preferred by the customer of uh, whether they would like to individually source the components or through uh, a single channel partner. Great, and Chris, this question might be best for you. Uh, when do you see networking protocols getting automated through Puppet? Um, well, you know, orchestrating complex changes can be uh, use. It can be useful to have Puppet involved when doing those kinds of changes. You know, one example is say you're doing a global OSPF to ISIS migration. There's a lot of planning and things need to be staged uh, throughout the life cycle of such a change. So you know, you're modifying administrative distances, you're modifying route filters. Um, this is where you know, Puppet Enterprise comes in where you can make these changes staged and, and then do reporting based on the results. So if you're gonna do, uh, if you're gonna do a region uh, ahead of time, you can then see you know, where are we in this process so that you know, it's kind of one small area where I see the benefits of of what we're trying to automate. Great, thanks. And Mina, we have a question coming in for you. How do you use Pup? How do you use Puppet being deployed and evaluated by customers? Um, I guess, or like, how, what are we seeing in the marketplace? I guess, um, in terms of deployment, uh, there's there seems to be two interesting scenarios that we've noticed a lot. The first one is where there's just network switches. They're deploying, um, you know, a couple of top rack switches and using uh, Puppet to just automate the network component of it. Uh, but also more and more as the SDN piece of it is gaining traction, customers are tending to deploy some of these overlay controllers based on VXLAN support. And uh, most of our all of our Trident 2 hardware supported. Um, switches have uh, VXLAN integration support. So you can have uh, overlay controllers like Metacura, VMware NSX, uh, you know, and, and there are several others in the market as well that we're working with. So if you are a customer and uh, you're tending to deploy these overlay controllers on top of Cumulus, um, and then most of these guys also have an integration into OpenStack. So what you start seeing is a complete stack of uh, Cumulus Linux running on bare metal switches with an overlay controller and sort of uh, you know OpenStack on the northbound, and then you have a tool something like Puppet actually orchestrating the complete stack. So there's we see this multiple tier relationship of how Puppet can be used for either provisioning, configuration, management, and also kind of this overall orchestration depending on the tier that the customer is evaluating them. Great, and um, Chris and Jose, this might be the best question for you. What's the difference, and how much more efficient is Puppet from Chef? Yeah, so Puppet and Chef are often sort of mentioned in the same, uh, I guess, the same same breath. But uh, there's a few major differences. Um, so first is that we use a, a declarative DSL. So with Puppet, you're, you're de declining the end state that you want systems to be in, and then the Puppet agent parses those state definitions into you know, CLI or API calls. Uh, with something like Chef, you're using an imperative programming language, so it uh, doesn't have a, a way to check state or validate state. 
Um, it also runs the entire script every time it executes. So if you have a service refresh, even if the service hasn't been updated or changed, um, the Chef script will run through and, and still refresh it, um, which may not be what you want. Uh, so that's sort of the big difference. Uh, it comes down to the language. Um, some other differences that are, I think, important to the network space is that the Puppet agent footprint should be smaller. Um, Puppet only makes the changes that you know, are needed to be made each time it runs. So if there's no changes, the Puppet agent gets you know, no work needs to be done, just turn off. Uh, or again, uh, a more programmatic uh, execution structure will just run through uh, you know, the entire script to get the configuration done. Great. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Jose. Thanks, Mina. We're out of time now. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. We hope you found this presentation about network automation with Puppet Labs and Cumulus Networks useful. We'd love to have you tune in to our next webinar on October 15th, where we explore unattended deployment with zero-touch provisioning. Or you can join us each week for Coffee with Cumulus, um, which is a product overview of Cumulus Linux. Details are available on our website at cumulusnetworks.com webinars. Thank you, everyone, for your time today.